This episode of The Candid Frame is brought to you by the Charcoal Book Club. Their carefully curated selection reflects the best contemporary photography for a reasonable price, and they are delivered directly to your doorstep each month. They offer free shipping to the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. It's subsidized elsewhere, and it's a great way to begin or expand your photo library. Join the club at charcoalbookclub.com today and remember to use the code VCANDIDFRAME at checkout and receive a 10% discount on your first membership payment. The famed photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson influenced countless photographers with the concept of the decisive moment. This way of seeing and capturing a precise moment in space and time set a benchmark many photographers have and continue to strive for. But one makes a mistake in believing that only one peak moment is worthy of being made into a photograph. This is a concept that photographer Ed Cashy explores in his latest book, Abandoned Moments. Throughout his photojournalism career and as a member of the Seven Photo Collective, Cashy has documented some of the world's most pivotal events with numerous iconic photographs. Yet this book showcases images made during those very times, but that possess other qualities that make the images as telling and as engaging as those that were published in magazines and newspapers. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. But thank you for making time for me, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much, and thanks for being flexible with uh, my schedule there. So, so what, what's helping to spark this conversation is your most recent book, Abandoned Moments. So let's let's start there in terms of just the title, because it holds a lot of significance for for the images and how to approach them. So, yeah. So you know, the idea of the abandoned moment is something that came to me when I was. Just pretty much a kid. I was in my early 20s. I had just moved to San Francisco, graduated from university and was beginning my career. And I started to hit the streets with, um, you know, a camera and a flash. And I was playing around with, you know, slow shutter speed, flash blur, all these things that in 1980 seemed like uh, magic. And I realized that, that the images that were successful in my eyes were made at a moment where I was in a moment of abandonment for lack of a better term that I wasn't in control. I wasn't, I was shooting from the hip or everywhere, but my eye, my face. And that, so then over the next 40 years, as I started to develop the idea and make more and more images in this manner, I realized this, you know, it's one of the many inherent magical elements of photography that unlike the decisive moment where, you know, everything is so organized and, intentional and conscious geometric framing all these things which is probably how i've spent 90 percent of my career trying to make those kinds of images yeah. the abandoned moment is where uh, it's it's just a moment of, of freestyle really and kind of being in sync with the movements of the world around me and the camera is an extension of my body and i'm in a kind of dance with the world this moment in contrast to the brisson's famed Decisive moment. Decisive moment. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's it's interesting because that that description of how a photograph is made and how it's seen has so defined photography over the last 70, 70 years. And as you said, you've used that kind of control of the frame very purposely in, in your work. But when you know it's as effective as it is, how difficult is it to let go of the control? Well, yeah, that's a great question. But I guess when I'm able to do it, because I don't do it a lot, but <clears throat> when I'm able to do it, there is this beautiful sort of freeing up of energy. And moreover, it's become actually a very useful tool in certain situations. Like when I've been working in conflict zones or places of civil unrest, or quite frankly, on the streets of America or, you know, New York, Paris, wherever, where bringing your camera up to your eye can be viewed as a violent act. And it changes, not only changes the whole atmosphere and the moment, but it can actually engender very negative reactions to me. And so in some ways, it's a way of hiding 
it's a way of being a little um yeah a little sly if you like as well you know and so it has multiple there's sort of multiple um uses if you like for working in this way so while when it it started in its most organic form it's just this idea of it was almost like brutalist where I would hit the streets mm -hmm. and I would literally just be walking. And if I saw someone that was interesting, I would just thrust my camera, make a f two or three frames, which is so different from the way I normally work, which is incredibly sensitive and consent and all these, these other ways that I work in my journalistic and documentary work. But as I said, it's, it's a, it's a really, it's become an effective tool in other situations where I'm either working on personal projects or on assignments where you know bringing the camera up to your eye as i said is a is a really uh like altering act not only can destroy the moment that i may be seeing but also you know put me in 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 a, some peril or some you know security risk particularly in places of civil unrest or or conflict in the film the third film that you did to promote the book um you walk us through sequences in which we get to see you see you work. And you can see that it's not just you st simply standing there and just clicking the frame repeatedly. There's a purposefulness about it. But how much do you think is that even though your technique for creating the photographs is different, how different is your sense of the scene itself that you are moving towards different? Yeah, well, so it's interesting. I remember, um, you know, Alex Webb, you know, who I'm sure you know who that is, the great magnum photographer, he once said, the key to a great picture is knowing where to stand. When you look at his work, it's always like, how did he get so many layers in one scene? And clearly he'll find a spot and stand there and then let the world sort of flow until there's the combination. I mean, I can't speak for him. I'm sure there's many ways he yeah. works. But, but I like that idea of like, it's about standing in the right place. Whereas the abandoned moment and this approach is more about flowing through things without mm. any control, but having like a kind of visceral intuitive sense. So I might be walking down the street and there's a character that catches my eye, but then I notice that there's someone else who's passing by or there's this great facade in the background. Yeah. And I kind of, I don't just stop and, shoot, I'll like sort of flow through it. You know, the big change of moving from film to digital cameras enabled me to make it more almost cinematic, if you like, in that with the, still with the film cameras, no matter how quickly I could <clears throat> shoot and rewind, generally the moment was gone within a second or two. Whereas with digital cameras, I can sort of flow through things. And it makes so much sense because I've, it's, I'm 22 years into doing video, so, you know, early on or midway through my, my career, I adopted working in motion. You know, there's definitely something there for me. And I've said this before where I felt the need to kind of break out of that rectangular frame. Mm -hmm. as, as amazing as it is and as, as brilliant as it is and satisfying to master that frame, that's not all there is to making images and telling stories. You know, this is kind of like the force, trusting the force to... In, in Star Star Wars uh, nomenclature, it's like <laughs> yeah. trusting, trusting that, and like you said, you, the ma majority of your images are sort of well controlled, and in in this technique, what I experience is that there is less of the presence of the photographer than in the images that are well controlled. Oh, that's interesting, you know, perception. I like that. I like that idea. Um, there's an exercise that I have my my uh, my students do is one of the one of the exercises is I want you to shoot without looking through the frame without re reviewing the images on the display and oftentimes they're terrified at the idea but nevertheless <laughs> every time we look at the work there's always something surprisingly good that exists there and yeah. it seems that you're yeah. speaking you mean don't, that you're saying don't chimp. Don't chip and don't look through the viewfinder as you're framing the scene. Got it. I, Got I want it. you yeah. to look at yeah. what's happening in front of you. And if you're reacting to it in a sense that there's a photograph here, I want you to make the photograph, but I don't want you to be so precious about everything in the frame. And the only way I've found people to do that is like, just shoot. You know your focal length. You should know just what it will be included in the frame just based on experience and make the photograph. 
that's and that for me that jives exactly with like when I used to work with a Leica. So you're working with a rangefinder, and you know I I associate it with when I was a kid. My parents forced me to learn violin, <laughs> but one of the yeah. things that uh, was that you know there was that point where at the beginning they put tape on the fret, you know on the you know to sort of for positioning, and then once you get past the point where you know the positioning, there is no tape, and you're going kind of blind because mm -hmm. you you do it by feel you know on the board where you need to be i see this as a similar sort of an of an act where whatever lens whatever focal length you use you know whatever equipment you're using you come to kind of understand it and master it so you don't need to look through it and you know that whatever the 28 mil lens is going to cover roughly a certain area and it's echoing what you just said with your the exercise you give your students that that there's something exhilarating about that it's also mm -hmm. terrifying because you know there's a lot of really bad images that are made along the way Absolutely. you know there's, but uh like one example that comes to mind where it was like a really um how can i put it useful was um in 2013 i was working in nigeria on a story about um you know the boko haram violence and all this and i came upon a nigerian army checkpoint and in general you just can't photograph the security forces in nigeria I did one of these things where I like sort of stood around and kind of, you know, fingered my camera and I was maybe 10, 20 feet away from them. They kind of didn't tell me to go away. And then at some point a vehicle came and they, they stopped it and they threw the guys on the ground. And I, again, I didn't bring the camera up to my eye. I just sort of shot from my stomach, if you like. And I was able to make an image that was actually published in the Nat Geo story. Whereas if I brought the camera to my eye, there's no question, not only would they have stopped me, but they might have smashed my cameras and so forth and arrested me. So, you know, that's a very practical example of where I was able to make an image using this approach that I would not have been able to do otherwise. And that's different than, you know, walking on the streets of L.A. or New York or wherever and just sort of free flowing you know, and some like amazing looking person comes into, into your view and you, you snap some frames and hopefully it comes out. You know, that, that to me is the, is the more exhilarating part of working in this way. Yeah. When it comes time to look at the pictures and make the choices, uh, you know, for a good part of your career, you're looking at those images for the purpose of storytelling, either using it for the individual image or because of the essay. But now you're revisiting older images in a new way, being more sensitive to this process that you've described. Is it difficult to not judge the images on those old parameters, right? Because you're, 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 the process of control may have been freed in the process of taking the picture, but as an editor, which is just important of a hat, <laughs> how much of that abandonment can you experience when you're taking a look at an image that was made without the usual limitations? Yeah. Well, that's an interesting question. That's a complicated one to answer. Um, I mean, I think I, I tend to, I guess I put it in two ways. If I'm looking at work to make an edit to tell a story, let's say, then it's possible that these kinds of images might make it, but it would, there'd be very, very few of them, mm. right? Whereas if I'm looking at my work out of context, which is really what this book is about, it's, it's decontextualizing my work. And just looking purely for the, the, the feeling and the form and, and, and you know, the, the, yeah, just that, the, those elements, then they can conform, whether it's a picture I made 40 years ago or a picture I made last week, they, they kind of can work together in a really lovely way, in, in my eyes. So when you're out in, in the field, especially when you were doing the conflict work, not only are you trying to tell the story, but you're also trying to keep yourself safe. The consideration of your approach, how, how does that work for you? Are you first making sure that you get the shot that you need for the traditional use of the work and then go, okay, I got a moment here so to play around a little bit? No, I'm, I'm about just in the moment, whatever I, I'm able to capture <clears throat> that will help tell the story, I'll go for it. And you know, whether I'm shooting more meticulously or in this abandoned way, it, it, I, I sort of go in and out of, of that mode, you know, in a, in a given day, in a given scene, you know, it's, it's really much more free flowing when I, when I'm in the zone, you know, like with anything, there are days where you, 
Yeah. You can't walk, you can't put a foot in front of the other, you know, you just can't make a good image. And then, but when I'm in the zone, you know how it is. It's, I especially feel that with video, there's just days where it's sort of like, I always feel I'm five steps behind, regardless of whether the work turned out well, it's a feeling. It's just a feeling because what we do is weird. You know, this capturing the world and documenting the world. It's, it's a weird thing. It's not natural. And, and, you know, I always say it's like we we're asking I'm asking you to allow me into your home to photograph the most intimate scenes and then ignore me. <laughs> you know, and, and it's the same thing on the street. It's the same thing on the street. I'm making a a, a a wager that if I pass you or I see you on the street and I start photographing you, you're not gonna like attack me or yell at me, you know, or turn around and smile and do, you know, hey, you know, like, you know, you know, glamp for the you know, vogue for the camera. So so within this, these weird parameters that this thing called photography, you know, it lives in, I, I, it's, a, it's a free-flowing thing. And it's really just about like, am I in my zone? Am I feeling it? Am I, am I, am I in sync with my equipment so that I'm not thinking about it? Or am I struggling, you know? Then, and, that, and that bit you just mentioned, being in sync with your equipment is so essential. You know, because you have to know what the 28, the 35, the 50 provide you just solely from experience so that when you raise the camera, you have a sense of what the angle of view is. Maybe not exactly, but um, that's essential in order to make this kind of thing work. Otherwise, you're most rely mostly relying on chance and luck to give you something. Yeah, well, there's a lot of Hail Marys involved in this, if you like, but, but you know, that's, that's okay. That's part of it. It's, you know, like I say, I, you know, I've done so much portraiture in my life and, you know, continue to do that as part of what I do. And this approach would never work, oh. you know, abandoned moment. It, that, you know, that's where I'm being super clear about, you know, foreground, middle ground, background and light on the, on the subject and all these things to create a much more, I don't know, formal is the right word, but it's, a constructed image, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's more careful. Anyway, yeah, this is this is about something else. This is the, the abandoned moment is really about freeing yourself from all of that and just letting it go, you know. Yeah, because some of the images are really amazing in terms of their complexity. You know, you're uh, there's a, one subject in the foreground, and then there's you know, someone between displayed legs and there's something happening here and there's an incredible balance that's happening. And Alex Webb, who you've described, there are similarities there, but what makes the, the images in the book that I'm seeing is that there's more of an absence of, of the photographer than it is with Alex's work. When you look at Alex's work, there is a sense of the photographer, the purposefulness of yeah. of there but it does bear some similarities in terms of the layering that's happening yeah and i always thought that it was incredibly difficult to make those layered photographs without all that intentionality but you're demonstrating that it's quite possible to do that <laughs> yeah well and some but some of that is decades of working uh whether i've mastered it or not but trying to master this idea of being able to see your field of view in multiple layers, being able to yeah. be aware of that. And that's something that <clears throat> doesn't come easy. Well, for some people it's natural, but you know, for others, it's, it's a struggle to see that. And, and, uh, and also that's not the only way to make images. People, I mean, you know, from August Sander to some of the great people working today, their images are very simple, yet they're incredible. That's the, that's the magic. It's the beautiful thing about photography. There isn't just one way you know, to do it. And, and, um, you know, my, my hope with this book or my desire with this book and, and, you know, finally after 40 plus years of, of thinking about this and photographing this way to kind of compile them into a statement that hopefully would resonate with others and, and have some impact, you know, um, it's interesting. I've, I've thought about how, like when I am in the zone, if someone had like a camera on my face, you would think I was a maniac. Oh. <laughs> because the level of intensity, the level of intensity, because you're like an animal on the hunt. You know, you're using your sense of smell, your, your you know, sense of sound, like every, not just your eyes, everything, everything, just your feeling. 
you're feeling the scene and, and, you know, you might hear something to your right and then all of a sudden it makes, it propels you in that direction or you smell something burning and then it propels you in that direction, you know? So, so that's when it's like, um, transcendent really. This, this, yeah, that. this experience of making photographs. I love that spidey sense about, about that. Yeah. Cause I'm a, I'm, I'm yeah. a street photographer <laughs> myself and I tell people all the time that it's that, moment of discovery for me that is the most enjoyable part that the photograph itself hopefully sort of encapsulates yeah. the experience that i felt but it's like when i'm yeah. seeing the potential and i see all these elements sort of coming together it is it is being completely in the moment but there's a certain joy that exists with it it's not just a technical practice yeah it's like oh crap if this <laughs> this thing is just gelling and even if i'm not looking through the frame of the of a camera i'm feeling it and that's a, a feeling i'm always trying to return to and it seems like you, you you experience it in much the same way yeah i mean i don't know if you know if there are many sports fans out there but i have thought about it it's similar to being an athlete in a way where you know, again, when you're in sync, whether you're whatever, an outfielder or a, a wide receiver, and, you know, there's like a, be a ballet to what they do. You know, there's a, this idea of being in sync physically, but also just having all of your senses alive so that you move through the world in a way where you can, like, do these beautiful things, you know, these things. And obviously for athletes, it's even on another level because of the physical endurance part and all that but anyway but i've thought about that um especially i don't know why baseball makes me think of that because often with baseball you might not do much and then all of a sudden you have to do something right you got to be exactly on point you have to understand exactly the circumstances of the context because you could do 20 different things you know and so in a way as a photographer in this vein i've thought it's somewhat similar that I could be walking down the street and maybe I'm bored or I'm not seeing anything. And then all of a sudden, some incredible scene unveils itself in front of me. It's like, damn, I better be on point. I better be able to understand, you know, what's happening. Where do I need to be? You know, do I need to move up, down, left, right? Do I need to run ahead? Do I need to go back? Whatever it may be, you know. And then at the same time, looking and observing foreground, middle ground, background, you know. And, and all of these things are happening in nanoseconds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the film, you you show a series of Im images in Iraq where some uh, Iraqi police were interrogating and arresting a couple of fellows. And what was fascinating was how you were doing just that, but you had to do it constantly as you moved, as you shifted, as the action changed. So did the choices that you made, because the choice that you made for, you know, for the first three frames was completely irrelevant because you had moved they had moved so it's like this there's this constant observation assessment choice to make the photograph and then repeat it endlessly until the the scene is played out yeah and and that's a, a really good uh, example to bring up because additionally on top of all that is i'm trying to understand what the hell's going on you know that i don't speak arabic and i in this moment i can't have my my interpreter telling me what's happening. I'm, I'm feeling it out. And, and in this case, this is not street photography. This is like serious circumstances for people. You know, the guys were getting beaten at one point and, you know, so that there's a greater sense of responsibility for me in a moment like that, where this isn't just about making cool images. It's about trying to like be not authentic, but, you know, to try to be, to honor the scene in a way mm -hmm. that, um, yeah, that is authentic, and that that um, so so that's that's a very that's a great example of where I deploy this approach, but at the same time, so all the aesthetic stuff is happening, but then there's the journalist in me going like, wait, what's going on here? Is this you know, am I am I making pictures? Also, these guys are terrified, and is it okay that this work gets public? You know, like there's so much stuff going yeah. on in my head in a moment like that. Yeah, it's more complicated. And in that, in that same scene, there's an awareness uh, on your part that uh, they're aware of you as a photographer, as a journalist. It results in a change in the behavior, which is the very thing that most photojournalists are trying to avoid. 
you know, the, the talk about yeah. this invisibility. But, you know, you've been in situations like that so, so many times. That assessment of is what's playing out in front of me happening as a result of me being here with a camera. You know, what are the kind of choices that you have to make? Yeah. Well, what's what's sort of, I don't know, it's not funny, but it was in the moment it seemed ironic that in that scene, at some point, they started to like beat the guys with rifle butts. And then at some point, the commander, and I had been spending weeks with them, you know, it wasn't like a one-off thing. He turned and said something to his guys. And then later, my interpreter said, he said to them, stop beating them. There's a journalist with us. You know, and so <laughs> anyway, it's a you know whatever. It's 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 difficult, you know, and it's interesting with with the new conversations that are going on, which I really uh, welcome in our profession about you know informed consent and 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 you know who has the right to tell whose stories and all this sort of stepping back from the conceit, if you like, of kind of people from the rich world going into the poor world and doing whatever we want and then coming mm -hmm. back and, and all that, that, you know, um, when I'm encountering scenes like that now, I'm way more circumspect about what I'm doing. I, and it wasn't like I wasn't sensitive in the past. I just wasn't thinking about these other implications. I sort of felt, Oh, I have a license to do this because I'm either on assignment right. for a major magazine or I'm a, I'm a photojournalist and I blah, blah, blah. You know, my work gets published so forth and so on. And now I'm much more like, well, basically way more humbled and way more thoughtful about is there going to be any harm that is caused by making these kinds of images? So I don't know if it's a good or bad thing, you know, but it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, talk to me about the, you know, the role of consent, how that, how that has changed over the span of your career for you personally. Well, uh, you know, it's, I've always, worked in a what I consider a pretty sensitive manner because that's my nature. But even though that is true, I, I look back on some of the ways I've worked. And especially when I was like on assignment, you know, for National Geographic in a place where it was just intense and um, or any major publication and, you know, you sort of don't want to screw up that, you know, I, 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 I can see I might have been maybe a little too aggressive or um, insensitive yeah, you know, maybe putting my putting my needs first. Mm -hmm. Needs isn't quite the right word. But, you know, putting my goals first. And again, I don't know if this is a good a good um, development, but I'm much more likely now to go. Hmm, should I be making this picture? Should I be asking this person these questions? You know that I'm. Yeah. Uh, and I think part of it is also I've been doing this for over forty years. I have two grown kids, so I've 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 like expanded my emotional range and my sense of being a human, not just a photo machine, you know, like a human being. I've also seen like, I've come to see that whatever my like, you know, hubristic goals were as a young photographer to, you know, bridge the gap between Islam and the West by storytelling all these sort of things is like, didn't do a very good job, did I? You know, th th <laughs> this isn't, you know, and I don't mean to be flip about things that are this of this importance and magnitude, but you know, that you basically are brought down to earth and that, so then it's more like at this stage, it's like, okay, given all of these circumstances and factors, what can I do where I can work effectively, mm -hmm. have positive impact and not cause harm? Yeah. And when I was younger, it was much more about, I got to get that picture. I've got to tell that story. Yeah. I'm a sensitive guy. So I'll do it. I'll do it in a good way. Yeah, it's it's questioning oneself about the entitlement that that one assumes it doesn't assume because of the because they own a camera. Yeah, I, one of the ex experiences I I had was when I f I think I first visited visited the Dominican Republic with my dad, uh, where he where he was from, mm -hmm. and we went to Dabon, which is a border uh, a border town between that and Haiti, and. We were driving back in, in in a in a van, you know. That's usually how you get around it with public transportation there. And there was a scene that I saw play out. There were some families selling a fruit or something. Mm -hmm. We stopped there, but their their house was like right next to it. And I remember uh, some tourists had stopped, and they were making photographs of the interior of the home. 
And I remember bristling at that because I couldn't imagine that had the roles been reversed, that they would have been as inv inviting about someone coming exactly. into their home to make photographs. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah. It, that was just burned in me that as a photographer, I never want to be the equivalent of that, regardless of the circumstances right. that I'm in. You know, that assumption yeah. is, is, is part of the things that a lot of photographers are having to consider today. Yeah. You know, recognizing their own entitlement in, in making pictures of other people's lives and providing that person dignity and respect, even though it may mean that you don't make the picture that you want to make. Yeah, it's true. And, and, you know, I always say that the camera is like a diplomatic passport into worlds you would otherwise never get into. And, but what comes with that is, is a sense of responsibility that just because you may have a passport to a place doesn't mean you can go wherever you want. And I think with the, well, I don't think I'm absolutely sure of this now with the, with the way overdue increase of diversity of voices, women, people of color in the profession, I think that's why these sensitivities have been brought more to the forefront. You know, mm -hmm. I like, I did not come from privilege. I came from a pretty rough situation, but it doesn't matter because I went to Syracuse University. I work with National Geographic. So my personal background was irrelevant when I'm in the moment with my camera in a village in Egypt or wherever, where I am operating with a sense of entitlement and privilege, even though I might not have been thinking that way. I wasn't aware of that. It was just yeah. like, oh, this is what I get to do. Whereas I think folks now, because there's so many more, again, voices, you know, a diversity of voices and, of, and sensibilities and, and experience, I believe it's expanding, it's improving and, and, and in a sense growing this profession in a way that is long overdue. Yeah. And so besides the creative part of it, where there's all this cool creative stuff that, that I'm seeing that I hadn't seen in the past, uh, particularly out of the African American community. Wow, there's so much, so much creativity there that's like finally being able to to explode, you know. But anyway, so it's just it's a very exciting moment in that way. But at the same time, it, for someone like myself, where I've had a span, you know, from like the '80s to the present to work, I also realize like in some ways I feel more um, not hampered, but um, I'm having to really re renegotiate my relationship to doing this work mm. where, you know, where I, I want, I need to figure out how I can continue to be effective and, you know, tell the stories I want to tell, make the images I want to make, but do it in this way that is, um, yeah, that is sort of, uh, whatever the word, whatever the way, you know, that is, that is okay. That is not, not coming from a place of privilege, if you like. Yeah. You've been doing video for a while. How has that affected what we're talking about? Because there you're doing, you know, you're dealing with a fluid movement moment, not just yeah. the singular moment. Well, and you're dealing with audio and, and narrative yeah. is whew, so much more like pressing on you all the time. At every moment you need to be thinking about, you know, the audio and do I need to, do I need to interview that person? Do I need to capture? So, but the, to answer your question, the beautiful thing in this, in the context of this conversation is now, it's not me telling you what's going on in Nigeria or India or wherever. It's the voices of the subjects speaking, mm. you know, because the way I work in most sort of linear narrative, you know, documentary work, again, it's not me doing a voiceover saying, you know, I went to the Dominican Republic and this is what I saw. I'm, I'm talking to the folks from the Dominican Republic and it's their voices that are telling us what they're experiencing or what the issue is or what have you. And right. so that's a that's an exhilarating part of this, and it's it's interesting, you know. When I before I did video, yeah, you know, as a photographer, you'll you'll shoot the shit with your subjects. You maybe sometimes get into really great deep conversations, and maybe you'll make notes. And you know, this is going before like iPhones and all this stuff. You know, you'll have a caption pad, and whatever. Now it's way more intentional and deliberate these conversations. You know, I'm sitting down with you with a specific set of questions that are tailored to the research I've done on, on your life and the issues that you're dealing with or that it might be germane to the story I'm trying to tell. So the conversations are so much deeper, you know, and in that sense, that's one of the many things I love about working in video. The, the motion part, you know, the visual part, that's also 
um, very exciting. You know, what's interesting with video is also though, you'll, you'll frame images, you'll frame, you'll film sequences that I would never photograph as a still photographer, you know, <laughs> like I would never photograph you with your fingers on the keyboard. Right. But I'm sure I'm going to make sure that I do like 20, 30 seconds of you dancing on the keyboard because it, even if it's a cut for two, a cutaway for a second or two, it's the sort of stuff that an editor needs to put a, a scene together. So it's a very different way of thinking, you know, as a still photographer, even in the most traditional approaches, but you know, you're, you're sort of compiling puzzle pieces for a final mosaic that where those pieces are not, they don't come preformed. It's like, as you, as you accumulate images, you start to see it come together. And with video, it's very different. You know, again, if you're doing very conceptual stuff, I'm not talking about that, but for doing linear narrative storytelling, you know, you need to compile sequences that allow an editor to create a scene. You're considering the sort of aesthetic considerations that you make for a still, is there sort of a pull between that and the narrative? You know, does the you narrative in video? in video? Do you feel like the narrative yeah. supplants any sort of aesthetic considerations that you normally would apply for the still photograph? Yeah, uh, yeah. Again, like I'm saying, that there's certain kinds of sequences I'll film that I would never photograph because they would be boring pictures, you know, or at least I couldn't make them interesting. But for video, they become essential elements. Um, but that still doesn't mean I'm not trying to be aesthetic or, or artistic in the way I frame them. And with the with the ability to have motion, then it, it affords more creative opportunities, if you like. Right? Again, I, I come to the, you know, fingers on a keyboard because it seems like something that everybody does. And so many people I photograph and film, you know, or film you know, that, that seems to be a scene that we need to capture. And I haven't figured out a way to make a great picture, a great still image of people on a keyboard, but you can mess around with video with, you know, slow motion or with long lens, shallow depth of field, all this stuff. So yeah, it's a different set of uh, aesthetic challenges. As a magazine writer and photographer, I spent countless hours evaluating and writing about equipment. They gave me a legitimate excuse to obsess over the latest cameras, lenses, and accessories. So I got to see a lot of gear come and go. As important as they may have been at the time, eventually those products were replaced with something new and shiny. However, the photographs created with that equipment have lasted and held their value. When collected in books, those photographs provide a lasting impression. That is why I believe that books are the most significant investment that any photographer can make. You can enjoy and appreciate this experience when you subscribe to the Charcoal Book Club and receive an exceptional monograph from some of the world's best contemporary photographers. You'll enjoy a great title every month when you become a Charcoal Book Club member. And if you don't like that month's release, you can choose another of similar value. They offer free shipping to the US, Canada, and the UK. It's subsidized elsewhere. Join the club at charcoalbookclub.com today. And remember to use the code TheCandorFrame at checkout and receive a 10% discount on your first membership payment. Because you were revisiting a lot of work that you had done over the years, some of there were certain images that had been published and used for the purposes of a photo essay or published in a magazine, but that didn't necessarily mean that that image was the image that showed up in the book. Like it might have been a variation of another image that you made. Tell me about the process of like revisiting the work with an eye for that different um, approach, that different sensibility. So yeah, this exercise, if you like, a process of, of, of going through my 40 plus years of archives and basically curating this compilation of work with the, with the eye towards, you know, what is an abandoned moment. Um, there are certainly images that, um, that have been published, you know, even prominently that were part of it. 
And what we were trying to do was move beyond that, you know, that again, it was about decontextualizing the work, you know, not choosing when you, when you're editing for a story or a narrative, you know, you'll, you're not just picking only great images. You're, you know, you're trying to tell a story and sometimes you need what I call, you know, the connective tissue to, to, to create a visual narrative. Whereas with a process like this for this book, it's really, I mean, ideally, every image is great and every image reflects some aspect of this abandoned moment. And it's interesting because I've gone, since we put this together, I constantly find pictures in my archive where it's like, damn, why isn't that in the book? You know, sort of like, <laughs> it's like, you know, or why is that in the book? No, <laughs> it's a never ending process. <laughs> yeah. Talk to me about the design of the book in terms of how it's sort of partitioned and the, the sequence and the flow that you, that you achieved with it. Yeah. So that was about a 10 year process, just so you know, of, of wow. uh, kind of, re, you know, yeah, because, and it was like maybe three iterations of folks who work with me in my studio in the course of putting this all together. But I guess they're twofold process. One was choosing the images. And I think there's a 68 or something images in the book. And we were probably working with a working edit of 150 images. And then there was the process of writing where I would ask to have prompts. Uh, so my wife, Julie Winoker is a writer now called filmmaker. So she was instrumental in, you know, kind of saying, well, wait a second, what are you trying to say here? And why does this matter? And, you know, like mm -hmm. putting out some of the harder questions of like, you come on, you got to like explain this better, you know? And so, well, as well as other folks who have worked with me to sort of get me to prompt the writing and, and you know, flesh out the concept in, in words. And then what we decided was that um, once we were able to get Alison Nordstrom, who was a wonderful friend and a you know really brilliant writer and um, curator uh, once i was able to get her to write the introduction you know i figured okay she's doing the heavy lifting of like the scholarly context mm -hmm. content contextual nature of this work instead of me writing like what to be like an artist statement i thought well let's let's play around actually i've written an artist statement and then we decided to break it up into these little segments that appear throughout the book so it was an interesting process on the text side where it went from the sort of conventional artist statement to let's break that all up and use it as a way to sort of, um, you know, intersperse with images throughout the book. And then the, the five or so title, um, not titles, but um, I don't know what you call them, sayings or, or, or sentiments, mm -hmm. uh, those were gleaned out of what I had written, you know. And so we were trying to be less narrative less linear to answer your question simply okay. we're trying to find a less linear way to put this together because it's not like the different sections truly stand out as as whole and separate from the others you know it was trying to find this flow yeah. and then in terms of the layout itself it's relatively conventional or you know that there's nothing weird or unusual in the way we designed the book you know i really wanted the photographs to speak for themselves you know that's why we put all captions in the back in the glossary because i i didn't want the, the image the, the pages with images to have anything but the images what did you learn about yourself as as a photographer as a result of the work that you put in to create this book hmm. great question um Poof, long pause here. I have to think about that one. <laughs> well, besides the fact that I love photography, is that um, is that I I I'm more than one thing. You know, uh, I'm I'm as a photographer that that regardless of what views or impressions, if they exist at all, about me out there in the world, that you know, I'm not just a visual storyteller and photojournalist. I'm not just a documentarian. There's also this other side of me that is much more expressive and free flowing and kind of, um, you know, there's something about photography where you can indulge in the, in the process of it. And that alone is enough. Mm -hmm. There doesn't have yeah. to be a, any other purpose. You know, there doesn't have to be an assignment or a story to tell or an issue to report on. It can just be simply, 
making images, just making images. And I think that's probably what I've learned in the process of putting this book together. And it's made me realize that in some ways I've lost that because in the last 30 years or so, I've, got, I've been so dedicated to serious issue-oriented storytelling and, you know, journalistic documentary work mm-hmm. so that it almost precluded that part of me that could be freer and playful. Playful. I love that word. Yeah, that, that, I think that word alone. And actually, you just made me realize something. It, is, it parallels my personal life. How so? Well, the, you know, well, I wrote an essay about eight or nine years ago that Time published about, you know, what happens when you, when you perfect invisibility as a documentarian. And, and this idea that when I'm in my life, I sometimes don't know how to be. I'm kind of lost in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, there are times where I'd come back from a trip and I'd be sitting at the kitchen table with my wife and two kids <clears throat> and I felt lost. I felt like, who am, like, what, who am I? They don't want to, they're not interested in what I've done. They're, and, and I don't, like, I'm sort of lost in this, in this world of, of, um, storytelling, you know, where you're doing it seven, eight months out of the year. I just realized like in the last five years or so, I've sort of jokingly said I'm in rehab where I'm trying to regain how to have joy in life, you know, yeah. how to, how to be more playful, how to, how to chill out basically. And so this is interesting. Just thank you for this. <laughs> no, because so, I, it comes up because I, I've been experiencing much of this kind of the same thing because I knew about how I felt when I was out making photographs and getting into that space and how much I enjoyed that, but also yeah. feeling that that was the only place where I could get it consistently. And so mm. it, I had to learn that it wasn't so much about the fact that I was making photographs or even the circumstances I was in. It was by the choice that I was making. And it was just the whole idea is like, <sighs> okay, I have an opportunity to be present right now. Am I going to be obsessing about what I'm going to be doing an hour? or bitching about something that happened two hours ago. And being in that such a place is just rife with tensions and chaos and judgments, right? Yeah. That don't happen for me when I'm making the photographs. And so it's yeah. like, well, if I can create that space for myself when I'm making images, there's only one thing standing in the way of me experiencing that in my normal life, and that's me. Right, right, So right. it's been an interesting journey to get to that space so that I can give to what inevitably has to be the most important part of my life is the time that I've spent with people that I love and I care for, even if I'm not making the photograph. So it's, I, I'm thankful to photography for giving me a sense of what that feeling is so that I know that mm-hmm. it's a space that I can return to. But it's not easy to get there. It isn't. That's beautifully said and expressed. It's <clears throat> There's just something obsessive about this 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 work this you know as I always said photography is like a it's a it's a condition that once you catch it it's terminal and it only gets stronger you know it's kind of like and that's and you see that with people who are amateurs who are just you know not they don't make it their profession but they just love it they can't stop doing you know they can't stop taking making pictures there's something <clears throat> intoxicating about photography how, how did dealing with the pandemic over the last two and a half years helped to shape that both your personal life and and your creative one yeah well in my personal life it was it allowed me to spend more time with my wife than i had in the previous 28 years thankfully we found out that we we do like each other and certainly (laughs) love each other and so in in that sense it was really beautiful and and also our daughter graduated from college in 2020 so she got a job in New York, so she was able to live with us for a year. So that was an incredible gift to have her home for a year that we otherwise would not have had, which also reinforced our love for each other. So mm-hmm. on the personal level, those were really beautiful gifts, if you like, for us. And then um, for me personally as well, I still worked and I was on the road, but instead of eight months, it was like three months. So. I was able to once again understand what it's like to, you know, be home most nights for dinner and, you know, chill out and watch TV with my wife and not be racing around the world all the time and and having all that extra time. So I also, it slowed me down. 
And I started to do things that I hadn't done and, and to be more careful. So, so those were all, I guess, the personal gifts. It, professionally, well, the first thing I did within a couple of weeks in March of 2020 was in character was immediately look for a local project to work on. So I decided to look at volunteerism in the state of New Jersey where I live. And I worked for like two or three months on that. And that was eventually published in the New York Times. So, you know, I, and then I did another thing on um, immigrants and the impact of uh, mainly Latino immigrants um, in, in a town in New Jersey, uh, you know, the impact of the pandemic on them. So, you know, I still was true to my form and my character. I continued to work on, I, I need to be engaged with mm-hmm. the world. That's just, so, so I found a way during the first year of the pandemic to do that without having to leave the state of New Jersey. <laughs> um, and then, and, but then I also started to get commissions, um, worked on, I went to Rwanda a couple of times, worked on some documentary films about a uh, teen mental health. So I was traveling around the country and, you know, but it was not at the same pace or volume that I was used to. I think, you know, the more enduring impact of the pandemic on my career is of, you know, presents some concern because of my age and the stage that I'm at. And there is, I did not anticipate this, but there is a certain ageism in this profession, uh, particularly in photojournalism. And so, you know, I'm also realizing like the timing of the pandemic, well, it wasn't good for anyone, but, you know, it was not great in that sense Mm -hmm. because I feel in some ways further, like, alienated or removed from the profession if you like yeah. and and simultaneously this not only a new generation but you know again this emphasis of working with people of color and more women which i totally support you know so basically it has not been the best recipe for my personal career in that sense but i'm still blessed and i'm doing fine and you know i i always find um ways to create work and and all, but uh, but there's no question it, it's it has presented new challenges that I did not have nor expect. Mm. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend a photographer for our listeners to discover and explore, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So, who would that one photographer be, and why? Wow, can I have a second to think about that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, I mentor and teach so much. I'm like going through my head of all the incredible young photographers that I'm <laughs> that I'm getting to work with. So I'm having to like, wow, to pick one of them is really tough. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, um, I mean, this is in, I could, there's so many people I could say here, but um, I'd say Isadora Kosofsky, who's actually an LA-based photographer. And she does... She's um, a young wonderkind. I mean, she's in her 20s, but she thinks she was in her 50s the way with her wisdom. But but um, she is such an impressive person and an impressive photographer. And what I love about her work is she is her, her ability to immerse. Like if, if you're going to talk mm-hmm. about immersive documentary work, yeah, she epitomizes that. And that, to me, is not only a great trait, but as someone who has done a fair bit of that, but at this stage in my career, I actually find it a little harder to immerse at that level because I have so much going on in my life, mm-hmm. you know, that it's it's much harder to give up everything and immerse, like, for weeks and months. And so I admire her ability to do that. Well, Ed, thank you so much for your generosity and your time. And uh, it's been a pleasure to finally have the chance to sit down and talk with you. Well, thank you. You're lovely. And by the way, I got to go to the Dominican Republic earlier this year for the first time to work on something. And oh, it's a where were you? Place, really. Where were you in the DR? Uh, mostly Santo Domingo and then a couple of, um, uh, they're not villages, but, you know, outlying towns. It was, just, it was a project about um, um, stopping... Um, um, ah, uh, child marriage and, and empowering young, oh. young girls. So, oh, but wonderful. also, also there's a deeper connection because my father, who's actually from Baghdad, from Iraq, 
and he had um, in the 1960s he actually had business in the Dominican Republic and I believe was it in 1965 when there was a revolution there? Uh, it was 60. There was political. It was, yeah, it was 60. Uh, the, the, the dictator Trujillo was assassinated um, in, I think in 1960, okay. 1959. Okay. Anyway, I just remember that, that I was just a kid but that that was a, ended up being a traumatic experience for my father so there's a deeper oh, connection. Okay. But anyway, that's it. <laughs> so... <laughs> If you enjoy the content that we have produced here over the years, we can always do with your financial support. We make every episode available for free. We've chosen not to restrict episodes behind a paywall or a paid subscription. You can ensure that it stays that way by supporting the Candid Frame financially by becoming a Patreon supporter. Thousands of people listen to this show, but only a handful support us financially. You can help change that by becoming a Patreon supporter today. You can contribute $5, $10, $20 or more a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. If you've been thinking about it, why not choose to do it today? Thank you so much for your continued support. Thanks to Ed for joining us. Find out more about him and his work by visiting edcashy.com and make sure to check out his latest book, Abandoned Moments. If you are a fan of our work here at The Candid Frame, you have different ways to support us. You can write a review on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts or share a favorite episode on your social networks, be it Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Remember to use the hashtag TheCandidFrame. And you can support us financially by contributing via PayPal or Patreon. Thanks to Tilly Bays from the UK for their five-star review. And if you can't find every episode of the show on whatever service you listen to podcasts, download the Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at Incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. <laughs>